Hello and welcome to episode 34 of our Conversation to Connect, Let's Get Real Talk, powered by Exceptional Connections. I'm Cindy O'Neill Davey, the founder and chief connector of Exceptional Connections since 2009. At Exceptional Connections, we offer intentional and innovative solutions to boost your business. And this month, we nominate a different member of our community to have a meaningful conversation with, so be sure to make yourself comfortable with a cup of tea or a beverage of your choice. And be prepared to take notes and ask notes. questions to the chat box to engage with us during our conversation. And around the 45 minute mark, I'll unmute the lines and we'll invite our listeners to ask questions and share their ahas and epiphanies and enter into our thought provoking conversation. And so the inspiration of our conversation to connect, let's get real talks, is to create purposeful conversations. We desire to be relevant during these challenging and uncertain times and to support our community to make an impact in the world and of course, stay connected. So as we get started here, I invite you to set aside your distractions um, and invest your attention to the conversation that's about to unfold and look for just one idea that you can take away and put into action so you don't cheat yourself out of the time you've invested here. Our conversation to connect this week is with Heather Morrison from Gaston, Oregon. Hi, Heather. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, and thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, it's really an honor, and we're excited to be able to have you share and discuss um, your three secrets to bulletproof confidence. So, yeah, nice to be here. Yes, so nice to have you, and uh, what an honor to have you speak to our community yesterday at our September event. So yeah. I'm going to just do a brief introduction and and then, you know, I'll have you share a little bit more about, you know, your journey, um, set the tone for our talk. How's that sound? Yeah, sounds great. All right. So Heather Morrison is a mindset mentor and confidence crusader who helps high performing female entrepreneurs up-level their productivity and confidence so that they can create a profitable business and life that they love. Her programs teach women how to value themselves, speak for themselves, and confidently own their voice, value, and actions. So they show up boldly and unapologetically. And that word fits you so well, um, Heather, because you just, you really do present yourself uh, boldly, authentically, and um, and unapologetically. So set the tone for our talk here before we dive in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the fabulous introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for, for being a part of this too. Whoever's out there joining us today, I really appreciate it. So just a little background on myself. I hit rock bottom kind of in my thirties. I had a fabulous work life, but my personal life was in the dumpster and I was continually dating bad guys, like really really bad guys, like drug addicts. And I was going to save them. Like they had no interest in saving themselves. Right. But I was going to save them. And I was going to throw everything in my life away to make sure that they were saved. Right. And so I realized that it wasn't there. It wasn't my fault that they were the way they were, but it was my fault that I was continually, continually allowing them back into my life. And so I did a little research and I discovered that I was codependent which basically means that you know, it has to do with tying your internal worth to an external validation. You only feel worthy when you're providing for other people, when you're in service to other people, right? So in business, that shows up as being you know, so, so busy because we're trying to be everything to everybody because we haven't established any boundaries, right? Not feel good charging what you're worth, right? Because you don't wanna make anyone mad or you don't wanna upset anybody. And imposter syndrome, which is such a buzz phrase right now, everyone's talking about imposter syndrome. And that simply has to do with feeling like someone else has to validate who you are and what you're doing as a person. So after I went through all of that, I discovered, you know, and talking to a lot of other people that they were going through the same issues and I wanted to help, right? If I was gonna feel like I needed to be in service to someone, I wanted to be in service to, to people who wanted to be helped, right? So that's where Bold Beyond Belief was born. That's where I started my business. Beautiful. So tell us um, what led you to discover your three secrets to bulletproof confidence? Because I know you've given us a little background, but you know, specifically those secrets, what really um, you know, was the catalyst for that? Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, I discovered that everything that I was doing or everything that I was lacking had to do with confidence. It was a confidence deficit, right? And so I really sat down and I, I truly sat down and I think that people really undervalue the beauty of silence because it's in silence that, that, that things happen, right? I heard a story a while ago about Thomas Edison who would fish for an hour every single day. And somebody asked him what bait he was using. And he said, I don't use bait. And they said, well, how are you gonna catch a fish? He said, I don't wanna catch a fish. He said, then what are you doing fishing? And he said, well, it guarantees two things. First of all, I won't ever be bothered by catching a fish. So I'll never have to clean it or eat it, right? <laughs> and secondly, I know no one's gonna bother me while I'm fishing. And so he really valued that hour of doing nothing, right? But just sitting in silence and thinking about things. And so that's what I, I did. I spent some time sitting in silence and really thinking and getting deep down to why don't I have confidence, right? It's not because of my upbringing because I was raised with a mother who told me I was amazing. So that's not where it came from, right? So I was trying to figure out where this came from. And I discovered that even though my story didn't really have to do with my mom in terms of what she was teaching me or telling me, but in terms of what she was modeling for me, right? So that made me realize when I started talking to other people, we all have stories and those stories keep us from moving forward, right? So that was one of the, one of the points. And then the other ones I discovered from, you know, just talking to people and discovering and point blank asking them, asking myself, first of all, why are you not moving forward, right? We live in a time that we are so inundated with information and I was told by somebody once that there's two reasons why you don't do something. Either A, you don't know how to, or B, you don't want to. And I thought, okay, all right. It's not that I don't know how to, because I have you know, Google at my fingertips and I can figure out mostly anything in the world, but why don't I want to? And so I figured out, well, I was scared, right? I was scared of what would happen. And that was, has to do with letting go of the outcome. That's the second one. And then the third has to do with letting go of perfection. Right? We seem to think, and this goes back to that imposter syndrome, we seem to think that everything we turn out has to be perfect and heaven forbid anyone see our mistakes. So I really sat down and figured out, you know, kind of diluted everything in my head and everyone else's head that was going on with why they weren't moving forward in their business and their life and kind of distilled it down to those three points. Hmm. Oh my goodness. This is rich stuff. Um, <laughs> One of the things that you shared that resonates with me is confidence is caught often more than it's taught. So, you know, as a parent, we want to be, you know, um, able to, you know, I'm trying to think of the word here, just, you know, uh, when you're consistent, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Giving consistent message with your mouth and also with your actions. Yes. Um, so yes. that's so good. Okay. Well, Let's dive into bullet confident, uh, bulletproof confidence secret number one, because I know you've outlined all three, but let's take a deeper dive here. Ah, so deep breath. This is all about letting go of the stories. Everything we talk about today is going to be letting go, right? So first is to let go of the stories. And everybody's got a story. Everybody I talk to, everybody you hear from always has a story, right? I can't get started because... And so everybody, you know, there's, there's a support group for everybody. <laughs> and I think sure. it's good to look back to reference that, which is why I love the quote that the past is a place of reference, but it's not a permanent residence, right? It was really helpful for me to understand because I kept trying to figure out, I was raised with a mother who told me that I was the cake. And if I found a husband, that was the icing on the cake, but cake by itself is amazing. So she was telling me that, but what she was showing me, right? This goes back to what you said, what's caught versus what's taught. What she was showing me is that it's okay to put everybody in your life before you, right? At the expense of yourself. And so that was my story. And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. I have that story. But if that story is affected me to the point that I was running my life like that, I was running everything through that filter that I have to service everybody, now that I'm aware of that, what am I gonna do with that piece of information, right? You can either, it's a choice. You can either use it as your excuse to stay stuck or your reason to move forward, right? Okay? So it's helpful to have that background and to figure out why you are the way you are today, right? That's helpful, but then go to work to fix it. Stop wallowing, let go of those stories, right? And you can ask yourself if that's a belief or a fact. Right? When your sixth grade teacher told you you'd never amount to anything. Okay, now you're 46. 
<laughs> and you're never going to amount to anything. Is that a belief or a fact, right? That was something that some sixth grade teacher told you eons ago. That person might be dead now, but you're, you're letting that person dictate what you do with your life or what you don't do with your life. Right. So that's my first step is to let go of those stories. Yeah. So it's a likely story or a, you know, <laughs> it's, it's something that that person shared, but may or may not be true. And you're right. You have to validate it yourself. Um, you know, I love the story that you shared with us um, at the, as your teaser um, in your talk yesterday with our community about, you know, you have two brothers that are in the same family and they respond yes. very differently. Can you share kind of that because I think it illustrates your point beautifully. Yeah, exactly. So there was a gentleman who was a incredibly successful publisher of a magazine and he was raised by a raging alcoholic father and he had a brother and they asked and they turned out tremendously differently. And so they asked the gentleman that turned out to be an editor, how did you do that? Given the fact that you were raised by this raging alcoholic of a father, how did you do that? And he said, I, what choice did I have, mm -hmm. right? How else did you think I was going to turn out? I had that as my role model growing up, but I was going to do everything in my power to make sure I didn't end up like him. And then they asked his brother, you know, kind of what happened, right? Why are you in the circumstance that you're in? And he was a raging alcoholic now as a grown man. And he said, well, what choice did I have? Right? I was raised by a raging alcoholic father. That was my role model. How else was I going to end up? Right? And so that beautifully illustrates we can use it as our excuse to stay stuck or our reason to move forward. Same circumstances, right? right? Two different, totally different outcomes. And it comes down to your choice, right? Let go of the stories and move forward. It's that story just beautifully illustrates your point. It really does. The importance of mindset and how we, you know, take in uh, situations that we're in, mindsets, and we, you know, be able to transform them so that they empower us instead of pulling us down or or being a self-fulfilling prophecy right exactly yeah. yeah i heard i talked to a lot of people and they say things like um you know well i'm not really good with money because my parents never taught me how to manage money well now that you know that your parents never taught you that could you go to google or classes or talk to fellow co-workers or other people or tap into a networking group and find out how to be good about money well you absolutely can so that you're using right. that as an excuse right and a lot of people that's their identity, right? They feel uncomfortable going outside of that identity because that takes work quite honestly, right? And it's just easier to say, well, I can't be that successful publisher of that magazine because I don't know how to do that, right? I'm, I'm stuck here in my story. And to give up that story, a lot of people don't like to give up things, whether they're, they're good or they're bad, we get a reward for our behavior, whether that's a good reward or a bad reward, right? Well, it's so true because, you know, in that case, in, in the case of what you're talking about, it's a victim mentality that they've held on to. Yes. And there is a payoff when oh. we stay in things. And I, I always, I'm reminded of that. I did um, landmark education years ago. And that was something that they brought up that I thought was really compelling is, you know, whenever you're in a situation, good or bad, and it's continuing, you're allowing it continue, to continue. The thing to ask yourself is, what am I getting out of this? That's yep. keeping me in this, right? Keeping me stuck as a victim. Um, so no, that's that's so important. I think it's a beautiful foundation for confidence, and mm -hmm. you know, a real integral part of that um, that you've identified. So yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. And I like to say, you know, I like to. My my son is twelve, and he came to me once, and he said, you know, I'm just not good at math, right? And I said, well, that's not necessarily true. You know what two plus two is, right? You know what four plus four is. Well, yeah, duh. I said, well, then you're just not confident about algebra yet. And so this is something I talked about yesterday. This has to do with letting go of the stories. That story you keep telling yourself, I'm not good at sales, okay? There's a lot that goes into sales, right? It has to do with marketing. It has to do with putting yourself out there. Going to a networking event and telling people what you do for a living is part of the sales cycle, whether you realize that or not. But people just think, oh, they just shut themselves down and say, I'm not good at sales. And so I encourage people to say, get really clear on what it is about that huge overarching thing you don't feel you're good at, dial it down, and then add the word yet at the end of that. That does a couple of things. First of all, when you dial it down, you realize it's not the all or nothing mentality that so many of us are fond of, of entertaining, right? 
Mm -hmm. I'm not good at closing sales. Oh, okay. Now we're getting somewhere, right? You might be good at pre-sale. You might be good at telling people what you do. You might be good at talking about the benefits of your product. You might be good about talking about the pricing of your product. You're just not good about closing the sale, asking for the sale. Oh, okay. Could you find out a place to, to get better? Yeah, absolutely. Right. And adding the word yet in there indicates to your brain that there's a possibility there. It's not so finite, right? I'm not good at sales and I'll never be good at sales versus I'm not good about closing the sale yet. Right? Mm -hmm. You could feel the difference there. You know, having the opportunity to understand that how our brains work and how we can empower our brain instead of, you know, get stuck in all the just the googly gop, you know, that goes on in our brain, <laughs> yeah. um, the survival mechanism, the ego, remember, you know, they talk about that, right? The, um, oh gosh, there's a, a name for that. But anyway, um, so, you know, it just reminds me of, it's not what we're doing as much as who we're being, who are we yes. being? Yes. Yeah. And there's actually to not to get off into the scientific weeds, but there's something amphibian called amphibian brain, amphibian brain. That's what I was Oh thinking. yeah. The reptilian <laughs> brain. Yep. Reptilian yep. brain. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. And what's interesting is that there's a science behind that. It's called neuroplasticity mm. and neuroplasticity has to do with the pathways in your brain. Yes. And if you think about it in terms of a plant, right? If you continually water a plant, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But once you stop watering it, it dies off. And literally, this is what happens to the pathways in your brain. It's fascinating. It's called neuroplasticity if you want to research it. The more you think that thought over and over and over, physically, those neural pathways, it's fascinating. Physically, those neural pathways in your brain get stronger. But when you stop thinking that, right, those pathways die. So you can literally yeah. rewire your brain. It's fascinating. It's mind blowing. But it's true. Right. So, and it's the other thing is, is that I, I was reading once there's a fascinating study around it, you know, just like you, you tell your arm to move, right. You tell your fingers to move, you tell your hand, you tell your brain what thought to think. It, it, it's just, it's fascinating. I really highly encourage people to, to, to kind of explore that a little bit that we just think, well, because I thought it, that's who I am. And that's not the way it works. We get to tell our brain what to think. And, you know, the brain is a scary place to go by yourself. That's a scary little neighborhood. <laughs> It can be. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why I encourage people to reach out, and bring someone else in there with you, right? Bring a buddy, start talking about these things. Right. Or journal. They say, you it's, know, journaling is a safe way to do it if you don't want to bring somebody else in, if you're not quite yes. ready for that, um, yeah. to be able to, you know, put things on paper and then be able to read them and reflect and realize, you know, is that me or is just that a thought? And where did I get that thought? And, you know, just yeah. really, um, I think the the filter that you use of being, is that a belief or a fact is a good one to ask yourself at that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's like, you know, and I always tell people, it's like, and, and great reminder, Cindy, to write stuff down because you're cleaning out that closet. When we have that big closet in our hallway and we open it up and the hockey sticks are hitting us in the face, right? We've all got a closet or a junk drawer like that. That closet doesn't boom, just get instantly cleaned overnight, right? You have to take everything out. You might have to go to Target and get bins. You spread everything out on the floor. You organize things, you label things, and then you put it back in the closet. Now it's organized, but it tends to get a little messy before it gets clean. And so that's what I like to tell people and just to give them a heads up that when you start working through this stuff, it might get a little messy and that's fantastic. That's a sign something's happening, right? You might get emotional about stuff. It might bring up old memories for you. That's great. That's called movement. And so many people shy away from that as opposed to like, oh, let's get right in that closet and dig in there and, and find out what's going on so I can change it, right? Right. Well, it reminds me of the whole idea of Pan Pandora's box. You know, you open it and it's like explodes and you can't close it and you don't want to. If there's if something in our lives that actually has that visceral re reaction, then the thing to do is what you said, take everything out and deal with it. It takes incredible energy. I'm kind of yeah. going through this fall cleaning, you know, they call it spring cleaning. I'm doing fall cleaning right now. Mm -hmm. And my husband is like, oh my gosh, because it's things are more chaotic around the house because you have all those little piles and things you have to deal yeah. with. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in the end, it feels so good to be able to purge ourselves, not only of things, but of thoughts. Yes. Or and I like to, no longer serve us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and there's the key, right? They no longer serve us, right? And I like to think of the acronym. I'm all about like quotes and little phrases, little things I could put in my tool belt to pull out I quickly. Love that. 
when I'm in the moment of frustration. Yeah. And one of the big ones for me that was life-changing is I came up with WTA, which is what's the alternative? Mm. Okay. When you're sitting there and you're thinking, you're going through your closet, right? And you're looking at that pair of pants that you threw back in there after the last time you organized your closet, right? Once I lose 20 pounds or whatever it is for you, what's the alternative? You can either cram it back in your closet and pull it up the next time you want to organize your closet, or you can donate it and move on and make space for something else in your life. And that's the same thing when I'm having a difficult time with going live on Facebook or making the sales call. Okay, Heather, what's the alternative? You can either not ask for the sale, not get the money, not start saving up for that house that you want to build, right? Which is what I'm doing, right? You know, like the, the status quo, right? Or you can shift a little, have 10 seconds of courage, pick up that phone, make the sales call, hear the no, which is fine. You get an answer either way. Now you know, and then move on. But it's going to go one of two ways. What's the alternative? You either stay how you are and stay stuck, or you shift just a little bit. You're going to be uncomfortable either way, right? When people say, let's get out of our comfort zone, it's not truly a comfort zone. It's your familiarity zone, right? Right. Because it's it's not comfortable being stuck in that comfort zone because you're chastising yourself either way, right? Exactly, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, I love that the way you said it's important to learn how to leave the imposter syndrome, right? Leave it at the curb once and for all and be able to move on and, you know, create the space for new things to come into our lives, new thoughts, new possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. And that has to do with letting go of the outcome, which is bullet point number two, right? So right. many times, we, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm just going to um, have you share before we move on. Um, yeah. I just think it was a brilliant quote about internal worth and external validation. Can you share that before we move on? Because I think that's something that, you know, our listeners can really benefit from. Yeah. And it's interesting. And I see it all the time. And there's so many things like imposter syndrome that can be uh, tied back to this. Anytime you tie your internal worth to external validation, you will always be disappointed. Mm. That's a writer downer. <laughs> it's for right. sure. So can you say it again so people can take notes if they want to? Because that's, yeah. that's yeah. beautiful. And anytime you tie your internal worth to external validation, you will always be disappointed. Mm. Yes. Right? This is why so many of us go on Facebook and if we post something and we don't get 14,000 likes, we're a loser, what we have, nobody wants. I'm not doing what I really should be doing, right? It's like, wait a minute, <laughs> you're entire in your, your, your internal worth to somebody, if they give you a thumbs up or not, you don't even know these people half the time, right? You haven't shifted as a person. The only thing that's shifted is that external validation. We do right. this all the time. Well, right? our, our society trains us that. Oh, absolutely. You know, to respond that way. And so, yeah. okay, so as a setup for your you know, second um, bullet point, um, you know, what, why do you think women are so stuck men and women? Mm. Why do you think we're so stuck? Yeah, because they, they, we don't move forward, right? We don't get started because we're afraid of how it'll end, right? Because of the outcome. Mm. And we, as human beings have this fascinating, you said it yourself, right? Our minds play tricks on us all the time. Our, our minds are so creative that we come up with scenarios that don't even exist. It's not reality, right? Fact or belief. It's not reality, but we have created our entire movement and our entire to-do list based on what we think the outcome is of this, right? And so I shared that story yesterday with my college roommate, which I'd love to share again today because it illustrates so beautifully how we do this to ourselves all the time. So I had a roommate in college. We had a, a neighborhood party and the guy from across the street came over and we had a party. And after he left, I said to my roommate, you know, it'd be kind of fun to ask him out for a date. I think I'd like to do that. To which she replied, and I'm not kidding. People think I'm making this up. She said, well, that'll be awkward when it doesn't work out. And I thought, okay, I hadn't even asked this guy out on a coffee date yet. And she literally in her head, she had us work through the coffee date, through the dinner date, through the relationship, which ended badly because now it's awkward, right? We, I hadn't even asked this guy out for coffee yet, but because she was raised with a mother who told her, don't go out and do these things, they'll never work out, right? That's the filter that she was running everything in her life through, right? Right. And we do this all the time and it sounds ridiculous, but we do this all the time to ourselves, right? Well, I'm not going to hit live on Facebook and do a Facebook live 
because I'll forget what I'm going to say. The dogs will bark in the background. My child will run through, right? Even if that's a fact, right? We then tie it to, I'm not going to get any money. No one's going to buy what I'm, what I'm selling. I'm going to lose the house. We're all going to be homeless. My kids are going to starve. It's like, you, you haven't even hit, go live on Facebook yet. And you've got this whole horrible scenario worked out, right? So we got to learn how to let go of the outcome, have a plan, have an intent. Don't go in just willy nilly, but then let go of the outcome. Because here's the reality that I really want everyone to understand. You have no control over the outcome anyways. You just don't. <laughs> yeah. And we like to think as human beings, we can control everything and you, right. you got to let it go. I have no control over if my son's going to make it to college. None. I can have a plan. I can have an intent. I can have that conversation, but ultimately it's up to him. And I have to tell you something, Cindy, it makes it so much easier. We were talking about being authentic this morning and I said, I'm far too old um, and far too lazy to be anything, but what I am, <laughs> it's the same thing with letting go of the outcome. I don't have that much energy in my life to try to control how things end anymore. I just don't. It's so much easier when you don't try to control the outcome. Right. Controlling how things end and also, you know, being your authentic self. And, you know, you and I talked about this earlier. You know, my mom always said to me, Cindy, you know, be yourself, be your authentic self. Um, everyone else is taken. And I always, that has always given me a lot of encouragement when I've ever been in those situations, because it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> there's only one me. <laughs> um, exactly. Probably good for the world, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> but, and that's a beautiful thing, right? We should celebrate that, not try to, to cookie cutter ourselves into what everybody else is doing. Exactly, exactly. So letting go of the outcome is so important, you know, and I, I love the way you say you have a plan, you have an intent, but you have to let it go for yourself and for your significant others around you, you know, controlling them is a, you know, fruit, fruitless activity, right? <laughs> well, and that goes back to the codependency, no, right? That goes back to the codependency. Which a lot of people, when I first found out, when I heard the word codependent, I thought, oh, no, I am not codependent. I am very, very independent. And the word codependent just means that you, again, you tie your internal worth to external validation, right? You don't see yourself as worthy unless you can provide something to somebody else. It's all about, like what you said, it's all about the doing instead of just the being, right? My value that I provide to my husband is not that I do dishes. It's not that I vacuum. It's not that I... It's who I am as a person, right? right? And yeah, and so many times we get that reversed. It's, you know, how, what am I doing for you? And we, this is one of the big ones with, we tend, we've become a society that wears the word busy as a badge of honor. I'm just so, so busy. I'm just terribly busy. And I always respond to people by saying, well, you really should talk to the person that handles your schedule and have a little discussion with her. And, oh, that's you, right? We're doing this to ourselves because we want to be everything to everybody. And we haven't established any boundaries because if I'm not serving everybody, if I'm not immediately responding to that text or immediately getting on the phone to respond to that phone call, then I have no value as a person. And that's backwards. That's not the way it works. Right. right. Being able to be your own advocate is important and really understanding that, you know, it goes back to, like you say, the doing and being, you know, we could be doing everything and exhausted and who we're being is exhausted, or we can be doing everything and who we're being is generosity to our community and ourselves. So it, it, a lot of it is the contextual, how we, you know, how we frame what we're doing. But I think the key is the being part. Yeah. I and I want to share, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm going to share a little story. You and I talked about yesterday, you mentioned uh, eWomen Network, which I think Sandra Yancey, wasn't she the one that yes. came up with me? Yes. She, and I went to one of her workshops and she shared a fabulous story that I like to share with a lot of people. She had um, a son where she was, she was talking to her son and she had gone to everything, right? She was on PTO. She did the book club. She did this. She was stretching herself so thin and she was having a conversation about her son when he was in like the beginning of high school. And she said, okay, buddy, look, you know, I was at the PTO meetings. I was at the book club meetings. I was at the fun runs. I did all these things. 
And now that my business is growing, I can't be at all those things anymore. And he said, you were there. I don't remember, like he didn't, you know, didn't remember her being at any of those events. And she's like, what? I, I spread myself so thin and was going crazy being at all these events for you. And it turns out he didn't want her at any of those events. He didn't even care. And she said, okay, now that my business is getting really, really busy, pick one thing. What is one thing that's really important that I'm there for? And he said, my football games. If you could be at all my football games, that's all I care about. That's all that matters. And she was, she moved heaven and earth to make sure that she was at all of his football games. And that's all I cared about anyway. So I think that the moral of that story is communicate with people, right? We tend to think that we need to be everything to everybody or they're not going to like us, right? I'm not going to be a good mom. I'm not going to be a good spouse. Ask them, ask them, what, what do you need from me? Look, I can't be everything to everybody. What do you need from me? I remember once when I was, you know, running around trying to keep the house clean all the time. And I said to my son and my husband, I sleep so much better when the house is clean, don't you? And my, my husband looked at me like I had 12 eyes. He said, I have no idea what you're talking about because <laughs> he couldn't care less, right? That wasn't a big priority for him. So ask people in your life and ask your clients, what is it you need from me? Don't just assume and then run yourself into a, a people-pleasing pretzel to make sure that that's taken care of, right? For sure. Communication is so critical. Yes. Exactly. Because we can't read people's minds <laughs> as much as we think we can. We really can't. Exactly. We don't know until we ask. We don't, they don't know until we share. Um, you know, all we can do is control what we can. I think you said, you said this earlier and drop the mm -hmm. rest, right? Exactly. Yep. Let control it go. Can drop the rest. Yep. Exactly. So share with us about a little bit more about confidence and how, how that ties in with letting go so if you're if you you know the, the the big thing about confidence that i think is a secret people think you're either born with confidence or you're not i'm a very confident person because i plan well right i prepare i have that plan i have that intent whatever happens after that is out of my control anyways so 90 percent of confidence is just being you know well prepared it's just showing up and just saying, listen, whatever happens today, that's out of my control. I have nothing to do with that. If people laugh at me, if people don't buy what I'm selling, if people, you know, that that's on them. And I think a lot of times we forget that part. And that's when people, you know, hurt people hurt other people, as the saying goes, right? So again, when my roommate was saying, well, that's awkward, you know, that's going to be awkward when that doesn't work out, had nothing to do with me. So if we can realize that, that you know, 99% of the critiques that are coming at us have nothing to do with us whatsoever, that will boost your confidence, right? Keep that in perspective, that when people say things to you, and I always, I, I like to give people this visual. When you're running, when you're running into Safeway super quick and you see someone coming at you with a clipboard, right? And they say those four words that we all dread, are you a registered voter, right? They're all having, wanting to hand you that clipboard. We do everything in our power. We go through a different entrance. We, we don't make eye contact. We don't take that clipboard on as our own because then we feel we have to do something with it, right? And yet we do this with people all the time. When people say things to us, whether that's on social media or in person, we take that on as our own. We take that clipboard on as fact, right? Oh, they said that. It must mean that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm no good at this. Who am I to think that I could teach this? I can't believe I actually wanted to charge that price for that, right? So the confidence in going forward with all of those things is letting go of what other people think of you. And that's a tough one. It's like you said, Cindy, we are, are trained by society nowadays. We're like puppies waiting for treats. How many likes did I get? How many likes did I get, right? Which is sad. It's so sad that that's where we think we need to have that validation from, but it's true. So I think that if you can have a plan and intent, let go of the outcome, release the stories, right? And just be prepared and planned. And whatever happens, happens. And it's feedback. It's never failure. It's never failure. It's just feedback that you can just look at and go, oh, okay, that's cool. Now I know next time I probably need to be better planned in this, this, or this, or it just wasn't my crowd, right? If they booted me and threw, threw tomatoes at me, I just need to go find my people, right? These aren't my right. people. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, the reality is we don't start confident. No, no, 
Absolutely not. Yeah, right? Absolutely not. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, one thing that's always encouraged me when I feel like I'm the S word stuck, you know, is, <laughs> you know, you have to be terrible before you could be good. You have to be good before you could be great. You have to be great before you could be amazing. And so I usually say to myself, okay, I'm not amazing yet, you know, in this area, whatever. I'm not where I want to be, but I need to get on that road, you yes. know? And so yeah. let's get the terrible over with. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, and that's the third point is letting go of perfection, right? Because there's no such thing as perfection and how dreadfully boring in the first place. You know, everyone looks at Simone Biles, like she's this amazing woman and she is, she's phenomenal. But what nobody is looking at is how many times she bloodied her knees, you know, or how many times she missed that perfect landing or how many times, right? Nobody's looking. And it's the same thing with social media, right? No one's looking at the fact that, you know, like I said yesterday, that that trip where that person sitting on the beach with their toes in the sand and the fruity, fruity beverage in their hand may be because this is their last trip together before they might be headed for a divorce, right? And this is their last trip where they can keep it all together or something tragic happened in their life. And this is that we're all, we're all sitting here looking at our, our deficit in our lives, right? What am I doing wrong? Why aren't I on the beach? Right. And you got, you've got to let go of perfection because we all seem to think that we're, you know, everybody else is in a perfect life and we're not. And that's simply not true. That's airbrushing, right? Yes. We all airbrushed our lives. Yes. And neither of those options work. I mean, you know, over hyper analyzing ourselves so that we're going in this loop or looking at others, because the reality is we never know what's going on in somebody else's life. And so yeah. it, you know, I just always bless people or whatever I see good or bad, just bless you, bless you, bless you, because yes. I don't know just from looking on the outside, what's really going on and what they're going through. And they don't know what I'm going through either. Exactly. And exactly. so and you, can, you, know, you can't control it anyways, right? You can't control it anyways. Work on what you can control and drop the rest. If you are envious of that person and you want that trip to the Bahamas, use that energy you've been given in your life to not sit and chastise yourself and hate yourself because you don't have it. Go to work to get it. If that's something you want, great. Start looking yeah. at how much you took it to the Bahamas is and start working for it, right? Right. It reminds me of the mind, the story you told of the two brothers and their different mindsets. It's all about shifting your mindset and yeah. cleaning a mindset that's going to empower you, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Absolutely. So we're talking about the third point now, let yes. go of perfection. And so how do we get started? If, you know, we've already talked about not starting with confidence, but okay, I get that. But at the same time, how do we get started if, if we don't feel that confidence yet? Yeah. Yeah. It's getting into action. It's getting into imperfect action. Beautiful. And I really want to stress that, that imperfect action. Again, it goes back to Simone Biles. She didn't land that perfect 10 the first time out of the gate. It took a lot of work, but she had to get into action first, right? We've all along the line, we've all bought into the lie that we feel have to feel confident before we do. Who told us this? Why are we thinking this that, well, I, I can't do that unless I feel confident. Why? Why? Why is that a prerequisite, right? So I'd love to share, and you allowed me to share my screen. So I'd love to share what I came up with, which is called the Confidence Competent Loop. So let me share that real quick, because I love the visual on this, right? <clears throat> okay, let me share. Let me figure out technology. <laughs> yeah, that's something different. Oh. Ah, here we go. Okay, can everyone see the loop? Before, yes. perfect, thank you. So this is what I came up with. This is the confidence competent loop. And the reason I love this is first of all, I love visuals, right? Second of all, this paints such a beautiful picture of what it looks like to have confidence. And again, people seem to think that you have to, to have confidence before you move into something right out of the gate. And it's not, it's take action. That's step number one. And it's take imperfect action, right? because you're not gonna know all the things right out of the bat. You're just, you're just not. That's not how we are built as human beings. We weren't born running, right? We were born crawling, then had to learn how to walk, then had to, and along the way we bumped into a few things, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So I always, I like to liken this to the first time you rode a bike. As a five-year-old, you didn't sit on the sidelines and think, oh, what happens if I, what, you know, what happens if I break my leg and then, Am I going to be able to take time off of work? And do I have insurance for that? No, right? You didn't overthink it. Chances are your parents put you on the bike. 
they pushed you on your back and went, here you go, buddy. And you went Wah! right down the driveway. You probably hit a tree. You probably skinned your knee, which is why every one of us has those rite of passage knee skin or knee scars, right? Because you took imperfect action and you did it. And you ran into a tree, which provided, and this is little bubble number two, feedback. That gave you feedback. Oh, okay, probably don't want to hit that tree again. That hurts, right? So I'm going to course correct. I'm going to change. So that feedback improved your competence, meaning you've moved your handlebars a little bit, right? You just changed your competence, which boosted your confidence. And so I want you to really take a look at it's step not one, not two, not three, but step number four. That's when the confidence hits us, right? That's when we go out and we say, oh, okay, I fell flat on my face. You quickly realized you didn't want to do that anymore. Maybe you went back and did some research about how to close the sale better, right? And that boosted your confidence. It didn't happen right out of the gate, right? So I really want to break the norm on this and break the myth that we have to be confident and we have to be good at it before we get started. Right? And that confidence motivates you to take more action, which will provide more feedback, which will make you even more competent, which will give you confidence, right? So this really kind of illustrates very nicely how, how this truly happens. We've got it all backwards, right? Oh, I love your confidence, competence loop. It's really brilliant. And um, just the visual alone, it just mm -hmm. puts it all in perspective and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. helps bring the shoulders down, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. And allow us to breathe and be our best selves and um, so, you know, the contrast to that is something that many of us have heard, you know, as we were being raised or even in the business community of fake it till you make it right. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> talk about that, you know, because when you look at your, your, you know, confidence, competent loop, it's like, yes, it gives us permission to just get, you know, in action, in perfect action and and just develop our must that muscle, you know, whatever that muscle is, and yep. we'll get there, right? Yeah. Whereas yep. the fake it till you make it is like you have to kind of put this bravado on, but you haven't done, you haven't gone through the process yet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I'm on a mission to crush that statement, the fake it till you make it. First of all, I don't really truly understand what that means. I guess that means, like you said, putting on the the bravado and saying that you know. Here I am the successful person. Well, first of all, I think that sets you up for a lot of failure. I think that sets you up for making people think that there's something going on, which is why we're in the state we're in right now, because everyone's faked it till they make it, right? Um, and I don't understand that. I don't understand where we got to the point where we had to, we couldn't show anyone our failures, right? We couldn't show anyone that we weren't perfect because why? Because nobody else goes through that. Everybody goes through that, right? We're so... Um, egocentric now and this is and this is probably not something people want to hear right you have to drop the ego you have to drop the ego right you have to let go of that you have to let go of thinking that all eyes are on me right everyone's focused on me right and a lot of that's out of fear I remember taking my son to school and he was so terrified of going to school and I said well you know what's going on there buddy because that's normal you know for school jitters but I really wanted really wanted to give him the critical skills to start diving into that on his own right you know why am I thinking this and he said, well, you know, because everyone's going to pay attention to me. And I said, okay. And we were walking down a crowded hallway. I said, what was that kid wearing? That kid back there, he was like three other kids. There were, you know, a bunch of boys. What was, it's like, I have no idea. I'm like, right, right. And he didn't care what you were wearing either. Cause he wasn't paying attention to you. He was paying attention to himself. <laughs> right. So the whole concept of fake it till you make it, I think is, is, is doing us a disservice right? There's a great commercial out and it's a, it's a woman and she's, you know, she's got her cell phone in her hand and she's doing a lot and she's perfectly quaffed. And then they back up. I think it's a vitamin commercial of all things. And then they back up and they show her and she's literally got three kids clinging to her legs, right? Her hair in the back is still in curlers, right? Her house is a complete mess. The dog is running around, the couch is torn up and that's how real life is. And somewhere along the line, we got afraid of, of showing people that. Right. I'm not interested. Like I said, I'm too old and far too lazy to have to, to have to sugarcoat that or have to airbrush it. Right? right. And if someone, and here's the other thing too, is that you will always be something. You'll always be too fat, too thin, too rich, not rich enough, right? Too old, too young. 
those are things I can control. I can't control how old I am, right? But I can control the way I look at it. So I'm not going to fake it till I make it. I'm not going to fake the fact that I'm, you know, 50. That's because I'm, I'm 50, right? <laughs> I can't control that anyways. But what I can control is how I look at that. Meaning I look at myself as experienced. I'm more experienced than someone who's 20, right? I'm not as experienced as someone who's 70 or someone who's gone through more life experiences than I am. If you can learn how to put the blinders on and not pay attention to what the world has to say to you, you won't have to fake it till you make it. Because you've already made it, right? Like it's like I said to my son when he said, I like the person that I am. And I said, buddy, that's half the battle right there. If you can like who you are as yourself, as a person, the rest just kind of falls into place, right? Right. Again, that's, you know, part of what we talked about in the beginning. And point one is getting rid of the imposter syndrome and being our authentic self and valuing that. And, you know, frankly, I don't, I've never really like you have gotten this whole fake it till you make it thing, because to me it's, that's inauthentic as we've talked about. And I think people can sniff that out. Don't you? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I think it, I think people, you're more relatable when you, I mean, we, we all want to be professional. We want to, we all want to be credible. Um, but we don't have to be perfect because in, and when we are, I think it, it causes people to not relate to us as well. Yeah, it creates a divide, absolutely. So, you know, I think that's really, really, really brilliant. And so, well, we're um, kind of towards the end of our program here where, you know, if there's anything else you want to share and then before we open it up to, um, to question and answers and, you know, uh, conversation with our community who's joined us here live and for the benefit of those who are um, part of the recording. Yeah, I just wanted to end kind of how I started. And that was, you know, my mother telling me that I was the cake and everything else on the, on the cake was frosting, right? And that's something I carry with me for the rest of my life. So I just want to share with your viewers that they're the cake. Like you guys are awesome just the way you are, right? I mean, Mr. Rogers was right. <laughs> You're awesome just the way you are. You're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. If you can truly to love, you know, learn how to love who you are as a person, then the rest is just icing, right? So Perfectly imperfect. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's far more colorful that way. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so before we open up here, I want to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about how people can connect with you um, and learn more about what you offer. And um, so share away. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd love to share a little gift with your audience. That works for you. Sure. So when I share my screen again, and I think I made this clickable. I think I was smart enough to make this clickable. So I offer what's called the Bold Life Blueprint. And it's super quick, not a big, huge project. I'm not into big, huge projects. It's just a super quick document to make you start thinking and to kind of plot out how you can start living your bold life. And the bold stands for boundaries, which once I figured out how to establish boundaries, it completely changed my life. And the bigger thing is to realize that I'm worthy of creating boundaries. I'm allowed to create some boundaries in my life, right? The O stands for loving ourselves, right? The L stands for letting go. And the D stands for doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Getting into action because there's knowing and then there's the doing. So if you go down to over here, the uh, boldbeyondbelief.net and you can click on the screen and I'll leave it up in a minute. I'll also put the link in our chat box if that's helpful. And you're gonna come up to this page. And so here, it says start your journey here, ready for a change. You can click that and we can get on a conversation together. And I love to do complimentary coaching calls, which means it's truly complimentary. First of all, it's free. Second of all, there's no strings attached, right? I just love being in service to people who actually want to change their lives, right? So it's a, it's a super brief about a half an hour phone call. It's just you and I talking, what's going on? Where would you like a little direction? And then we can end it there. So, and then down at the bottom here is where you're gonna find the Bold Life Blueprint. There's also a bonus there. It's called the productivity amplifier and it's how to get, how to be twice as productive in half the time. Cause I love streamlining things. So let me bring that up again. And again, if you click at the bottom of here, there's a link that'll take you over there and I'll put the link in the, yeah, the page as well. And my contact information is there. You can email me from there. You can hop on the phone with me from there. Nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I went ahead yeah. and, um, pop to your bold life blueprint and uh, to schedule a conversation and your website in the, the chat box already. Right. Um, yeah. So 
Okay, awesome. Let's um, let's go ahead and anybody who has an epiphany, a takeaway, a question, this is the time. Heather's available. Feel free to unmute yourself and raise your hand, and we'll we'll just have you join our conversation. Love to hear it. So, Chuck, you've unmuted yourself. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it was a great presentation again today. Lots of good information. And um, as I said before, uh, one thing I am, I am a recovering perfectionist. Mm. <laughs> I've been working on myself for years trying to get out of it. And uh, what you say is so true is that um, I think one of the hardest parts has been Letting myself, letting go of the ego, and uh, make allowing myself to be vulnerable. And this is something that men are taught not to do. I, I, I and this is a real problem with like when you network with men, they will never allow themselves to be vulnerable ever. I mean, with few exceptions in, in, in a business environment. And I found out after getting away from my perfectionism, that that was a, a barrier, a story that I learned and was taught and believed because I didn't want to look foolish, right? So I didn't, wouldn't open myself up. So you don't open yourself up for risk. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm getting out of this is that, you know, I think people need to keep that in mind, you know, that people aren't going to laugh at you you know, he said yesterday, you know, so, so that was kind of my opinion that I'm, I'm getting from this. You know? so. Yeah. Chuck, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being vulnerable there. Right. I think we're taught as a society, men, especially, right. You don't cry. You don't show tears. You take a laugh, you, you know, you walk it off, you go hit the showers, right. We're not allowed to, because somehow along the line, that's become equated with weakness. Right. And I yes, love that exactly. you had yeah, and I love that you had the epiphany that that is just a story you're telling yourself. It's something society has told, especially your generation, for a long time. And I think now it's just that that's a big shift to turn, right? And I think just now with my son's generation, that's starting to change a little bit. So hallelujah. But in the meantime, you don't have to wait for that shift to turn. You turn it yourself, right? So I love that you, Chuck, are coming to that reality. And I love that you also brought up the point that, you know, it's okay if people laugh at you. Because that's on them. Who cares? You're never going to, you know, you're never going to see these people. Chances are, again, and even if you do, when you said and you did it so beautifully, when you when you you know cut yourself off from that risk of being laughed at, you also cut yourself off off, off from the risk of being vulnerable and being open to other people, right? And that's a beautiful thing to be. Well, the one thing it's done for me and <clears throat> it does for everybody. It reduces significantly the amount of stress that you put on yourself. I mean, I didn't even realize how much stress I was putting on myself over the many decades. And I was trained to do that. And it became like a norm, right? Yeah. Well, and the funny thing is that, you know, you bring up a really good point. They're going to laugh. They're, here's a secret check. They're going to laugh anyways, right? If you go to Amazon and you look at book reviews and there's 40,000 book reviews for a best-selling book. And there's one that's five star, best book I ever read. And right below that is a one star review that said, this is a piece of trash. I wouldn't line my kitty litter box with it, right? So it doesn't matter what you do. You're going to be criticized for everything. You're going to be criticized for being too mouthy, too bold. You're going to criticize for not speaking up enough. So who are we trying to, you know, what, this is the fake until you make it, right? Who's Whose box are we trying to fit into? You're never going to fit into everybody's box. You are not a pizza. Not everybody's gonna like you, right? You just gotta be okay with that. But see, you brought up such a great point is that directly you're like for myself, you're actually asking for external validation, right? Exactly. So you make exactly. there. Yeah. Yeah. And when you let go of that, when you're like, I do what I do because it helps me and hopefully it helps someone else along the way. But if you don't like it that's okay. And it doesn't, it doesn't upset me and it doesn't frighten me and it doesn't make me change who I am as a person. 
that that makes you realize that you're not going to get the experience or the the reaction you thought you were going to get from me right which is to tear me down which is what most people's intent and nine times out of ten they don't do it intentionally it's just what they've been taught right it's the filter they're running everything through so realize that has not that has nothing to do with me if they come at me and they say you're too mouthy well uh, okay right you're too loud you're too whatever that's not on me that's okay that's not a clipboard i have to take that's just a little bubble of words that are i can just leave looking in the sky and going yeah okay well that's interesting information i'm not doing with anything with that i'm just gonna let it hang there in the sky and go about with you know go about my business so it's a really good point Chuck. I love this conversation because it reminds us that we don't have to be everybody's cup of tea. <laughs> you can't be right. That's no. not my job. That's not my job. I'm not, you know, and it's funny is it? it's that I'm not here to be anybody's friend, right? I, I love friendship and I love when people get along, but if they don't, that's okay. That's not my job. Right. And once we release that and let go of being that peacemaker and having to be everything to everybody, like Chuck said, it becomes so much easier when you don't care what people have to say. And it's not as if you're taking the attitude, well, I don't care what they have to say. I think a lot of times when I say that I teach people how to show up boldly and unapologetically in their business, they look at that word unapologetically and they think that's a negative because it's been used in that context, especially recently, right? This is my opinion. I don't care what your opinion is, right? I have no concern for your opinion and I'm gonna tell that, you, that you're a bad person for having that opinion, right? That's, that's the negative unapologetic. Unapologetic to me just means this is who I am as a person and if you don't like it, that's okay. That's okay, viva la difference, right? You need to go find people that you align yourself with and that make you feel good about yourself. Yes, because it's not about them, it's about you. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah. So when we're winding down here towards the end of the hour, um, this has been an amazing conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and it, it just a lot of nuggets you've given us to chew on and to really think about in terms of what we want for our lives and how we can show up and to empower us. And especially your, um, the loop that you shared, your confidence, confidence loop. So um, anybody else have anything they wanna share? One of the gals had to leave and she's, uh, Susan said, I love the presentation and your energy. <laughs> and she appreciated Chuck's comments too, so. Of course. That's and great. the the confidence confident loop, I actually got the influence from uh, Brendan Burchard. So if you don't know who Brendan Burchard is, take a look at what he's got to say. He's, he's a great, he's a really dynamic leader. I really appreciate his stuff, so. Nice. And then you also mentioned um, a book that you recommended by uh, Brene Brown, was it? I did. And I love this story. So Brene Brown has a book called Daring Greatly. She has a million books, but one of her books is called Daring Greatly. And that came from <clears throat> the last line in a Theodore Roosevelt poem. And I think it's called The Man in the Arena. You can Google it. And it talks about the victory doesn't go to the person who won. The victory goes to the person who's in the arena with the most dirt on their face and the most blood on their knees, who's trying again and again and again, because at the end of the day, that person was the one that was daring greatly, right? And I, and I love the idea behind that because we seem to think we're so focused on the, the, the doing, right? And we're so focused on that end goal. And for some reason, if we don't make that end goal that we set off to make, we're a failure. And that's not where the victory comes in. The victory comes in from continuing to try, like fall down nine times, get up 10, right? Yes. That's where the true victory comes in. So I love, I love that poem by Theodore Roosevelt. Oh, that is beautiful. Uh, you're, you're reminding me of a little poem that I committed to memory when I was a young girl. And it would always encourage me and inspire me. And I remember typing it on a typewriter, cutting it out. <laughs> putting it on a board, shellacking the board and literally putting it on my wall. And I just, mm -hmm. going through my garage recently, I just uncovered it and I was like, it, it looked really rough. <laughs> but I did that and I committed it to memory. Uh, would you mind if I shared that just in closing? I love here? poems. Yes, please. Okay. And I can't remember who, I, it, I believe it's just an anonymous poem, but it's, you know, you've probably heard this. So think, if you think you can do it, you can. 
If you think you dare not, you won't. If you'd like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost a cinch you won't. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. Mm. And so there's so much of that that I, and I kind of grabbed onto as a young girl to encourage myself and just your beautiful, um, you know, secrets, uh, bulletproof secrets that you've shared with us today that really resonate with me. And I just want to thank you for um, your heart and desire for making a difference in the lives of men, women, and the youth, our youth. I know you and I spoke about that. And I just thank you so much for sharing your brilliance with our community yesterday and then also today and for the, the replay that'll benefit so many others. Um, so, so thank you so much, Heather. It's just been a joy to get to know you and to be able to hear your wisdom and, um, and learn what you're up to. So I know that I gave you a chance earlier to share, but is there anything, any parting comments that you want to leave our listeners with? Mm. That's a really good question. You know, I just keep coming back to the conversation I had with my son about him saying that he really likes the person he is. And so I think that we need to focus more on becoming the person that we like and not worry about the person that everybody else is going to like. Mm, that's beautiful. And the fact that he said that is, is speaks wonder, speaks volumes to the love and the support and the mentoring that you've provided him with the environment um, and what a beautiful thing for a young person to have that because most young people are very insecure. There's a lot of challenges right now with young people and their, you know, their mindset. So uh, kudos to you and your husband and, um, and also just to the journey that your, your son is on. It's very encouraging to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Just so, good. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for letting me share. You've, oh. you've built up such a beautiful dynamic community city and that's, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe and you have really attracted such a beautiful group of people around you so thank, oh, you, thank you well that's that's our heart desire and that's our our place in culture to make a difference in mm. you know that pillar of society of education and business so i appreciate you saying that so for those who are listening thank you for joining our 34th conversation to connect let's get real talk um we invite you to join us on the third wednesdays that's when we normally um have conversations with our spotlight speakers um, and we do have an event uh, that's uh, scheduled um, in October. So check our Exceptional Connections Facebook page for more information. So thanks so much for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks.